Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Hey, come on, move up front, sit down. Hey, turn off your cell phones, please. That's one. Second rule is be civil. Third rule is wait for the mic to come to you when you ask the when you want to ask your questions. We will we will allow people to ask their questions. Don't worry, we have time. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, Councilman Levin has has is in the room, and I'm told that Councilman Lander will be coming later, and that Catherine from his office is here, and we have a whole slew of folks from the EPA. Natalie Loney didn't want me to mention her name, so I did it. And Christos Tsimas, uh, what Simis, whatever it is, Tsimas. There you go. He told me how to pronounce it, but I knew it screwed up. Uh, he's here, and, and Brian Carr is here, and a whole bunch of folks from the city. And we're all here to listen to a presentation, a uh, fascinating presentation about uh, a, a, a really sexy uh, subject, a retention tanks on the Gowanus Canal. One that I've known about for God knows how many years because of uh, my close relationship with Mr. Scotto. Uh, I won't deny it, I love Buddy. And uh, may I please introduce to you our commissioner uh, from the DEP, Emily Lloyd, who will give us a presentation. Thank you, and thanks, Mark, for hosting the meeting. Um, for those of you who, uh, if there's any room to move up, I encourage you, the screen's a little smaller uh, than maybe would be ideal, so I just want to make sure everybody can see everything as we go through the slides. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to have it be a sort of overview. Um, obviously, the CAG is meeting and, and is familiar in great detail with everything having to do uh, with the work around uh, the Superfund site. Uh, we have several pieces of work we DEP going on, some which actually predated that work, um, particularly having to do with what's called a long-term control plan. We also have high-level storm sewers um, that are the, the, um, the work being done by the utilities is starting for those. So we thought it would be a good idea maybe to have a sort of overview meeting and as I will tell you in a few minutes we actually will be having meetings about each of those topics. Tonight we did want to focus on the work we've been doing uh, to find sites for two CSO retention tanks. We've been ordered to build two tanks um, by the EPA and to uh, find sites uh, to come up with two sites for each of two tanks by the end of this month. So we're in the process of doing that. Uh, but prior to doing that, we thought it would be good to give people an idea of the sites we were looking at, how we were screening them. Um, and, and we have a, a list at this point of about 14 that uh, could possibly be included. So we just wanted to get people familiar with those. So most of you know um, a whole lot about this topic. Um, but just to, just to start, um, as, as you know, uh, the Gowanus Canal has had uh, water quality issues for a very long time. It was built in 1860. Um, very soon thereafter, there started to be complaints about the water quality. Um, and uh, in 1911, and odors, um, it was really an industrial site. In 1911, uh, the city built a flushing tunnel to bring in fresh water from the East River to try to help the tidal flush a little bit. And that, I think, I'm told, did help some for as long as it worked. But then in 1969, it was, uh, it was out of commission, and then it was out of commission for decades. Um, there were tanneries, uh, textiles, dyers, all this along the canal. Um, but EPA's work is really focused on two uh, types of pollution. Uh, first of all, the pollution from the manufactured gas plants, which were um, at, at these three uh, green sites, and also um, pollution from years of combined sewer overflows going into the canal. Um, Craig Hammerman said, maybe you ought to just explain what a combined sewer overflow is. Um, so there may be somebody here who doesn't know exactly how that works, so I will just briefly describe it. Um, 
the sewer systems in about two-thirds of the city are what are called combined sewers. That means that the sewage from your house goes into the sewer, and then when it rains, the water frequently from the downspout from buildings also goes into the sewer, as does all the water uh, from the catch basin in the street. Uh, and then it goes to a wastewater treatment plant nearby. When there is heavy rain, uh, typically the sanitary sewer takes up about 10% of the capacity of the sewer line. When there's heavy rain, and we all know that there is increasing, there are increasing incidences of very heavy rain, microbursts particularly, um, the sewer gets full uh, with the storm water in addition to that uh, sewage from houses. Um, and when it gets to the point where there's not enough capacity at the wastewater treatment plant, some of it overflows into the nearest body of water uh, near to um, wherever that point in the, in the sewer system is. I'm sorry. And so the, the Gowanus um, is unfortunately um, located between two entire drainage systems. So it gets combined sewer overflows from both of these drainage systems. The one uh, that goes to the Red Hook wastewater treatment plant and the one that goes to the Owl's Head wastewater treatment plant. And of those, there are two that are, that make up about 75% of the combined sewer overflows. The one uh, which is Red Hook 34 at the head of the canal, that's responsible for about 50% of the combined sewer overflows going into the canal. And then another uh, at Outfall, Owl's Head 007, uh, which is responsible for about 25%. So those have been the focal point um, of the remediation um, since, the, since the start. Now there are lots of things you can do to um, try to mitigate uh, combined sewer overflows. Um, and as I said a long while back, there was the flushing tunnel to try to wash, uh, to try to flush out the, uh, the canal, which didn't flush well from the tide. Um, and there are many others. Uh, for a long time, we didn't do uh, very much, especially when the flushing tunnel was not working. Um, and now we're doing several that I'll mention. Um, the first and sort of the, the ideal thing to do is capture the rainfall as it comes out of the sky and hits the ground before it gets into the catch basin um, and down into the sewer system. And this is, I'm sure you've all been hearing about green infrastructure. Everyone's very excited now about green infrastructure, um, as are we. And typically, you see them, you may, you'll be seeing them around this neighborhood more and more. They're called bioswales. They're typically built in the sidewalk. And they look like an, a very large tree pit with a lot of lush uh, plantings in it. And the idea is they have gravel beds beneath them. The idea is to capture some of the rainwater in that. These are plants that soak up a lot of water. Um, and also, it's built to be a retention basin to hold that water uh, while the plants soak it up and have it not get into the catch basin system. Um, a second thing you can do is sort of manipulate the, uh, the sewer system itself by adding pumping stations where you would have CSOs. So you move that along and try to get, if there's a bottleneck there, get it to where you have more capacity in the sewer system. And eventually, some of it may spill someplace else in a water body that's less sensitive. You hope most of it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, you can put do floatable screens. I think something that um, many people, one of the things they find most objectionable about combined sewer overflows is the debris you see floating in the water, much of which is, are things you'd rather not see at all, much less floating in the water. Um, and so the screens screen those out. We have some that are being installed right now. They're not working yet. Uh, but they will be in by the end of the fall. That's something that you can do. Um, and you can also, in the case of a, of a uh, canal or a creek that doesn't have much freshwater flow anymore, you can try to add more and flush it better, which is with the, the, the restored flushing tunnel, um, what we've been doing now for, for several months. Um, you can also build, which we are also doing, I think many of you know, what are called high-level storm sewers. And the idea, most sewer lines run fairly deep under the street. A high-level level storm sewer is very shallow right below the catch basin. The idea is to catch the storm water right as it comes off the street and into the catch basin and take that storm water before it's touched any raw sewage and discharge it into the nearest waterway. 
Um, and so that can keep it from getting mixed with any raw sewage and beco becoming uh, combined sewer overflow. And we are building a system of high level storm sewers in this area, uh, to both to try to address some uh, ponding and other flooding problems you have around here, um, and to try to keep, we think, up to 50% of the storm water out of the combined sewer uh, by keeping it in the high level storm sewer system. As, let me say as an aside, these high level storm sewers we don't think are going to solve all the problems that people have been having around 4th Avenue. We think there are other problems that we're investigating, but this is something that we think will help um, with some of them. And there are two phases of that um, that are being built. The, the um, utility work for the first one is underway now, causing lots of headaches for people. So, I mentioned that there are three processes going on at the same time, um, and we will be uh, having meetings to talk about all of them. The first is, uh, and, and certainly the highest profile, is the Superfund work that is focused on the tanks, and right now we have an order to find sites for two tanks and to design two tanks. Um, and that is what uh, the, the siting is underway now. I'll talk about it in a little more detail. And then we will go from there when we have a short list of sites, uh, we will go into designing um, the tanks. Uh, the second is what's called a long-term control plan. Uh, we have 11 of these plans that we are under a consent order from the Department of Environmental Conservation, the state agency, to develop. And that is also focused on CSOs. Um, and in some areas where we are doing these, there's no contamination from industrial sources. It's really primarily a CSO problem. And so uh, the long-term control plan is meant to do most of the work of, of cleaning up, at least in terms of, of legal discharges, problems in the water body. In this particular case, and in Newtown Creek, another Superfund site, obviously the CSOs are only part of the problem. This, when this uh, work gets more underway, um, in terms of actually developing the plan, we will also be having a meeting like this one, as we are required to do by DEC. Um, and that will be um, sometime towards the end of October, probably. So it will be, it will cover some of the same ground, because it's hard to talk about the long-term control plan without talking about the Superfund. It's hard to talk about Superfund without the long-term control plan. Um, but we are required to have a separate meeting, and we will do so. And, and I think sometimes it helps to separate them out a little bit uh, for clarity of discussion. And then this is the utility work that's starting. It started earlier this summer. Um, and uh, we've had several requests uh, to have an informational meeting about that work, and we will also be doing that in October. So don't make any other plans in October because um, we're going to be having, expecting you to be at a lot of meetings. So that will be an informational meeting about the utility work, and it's leading into the actual uh, construction of the sewers. The utilities have to be gotten, moved someplace else first so we can put the sewers in. And that's phase one of that work. Okay, so now I, what I'd like to do is walk you through, we have narrowed this down um, to 14 sites, and I'd like you just to walk you through that, um, and then we can uh, have a little more discussion of um, the individual sites, and Kevin Clark is here, who's our project manager um, for this, and, and he uh, will be able to answer questions too about uh, the individual uh, what we know at this point about the individual sites. So we started with, we started with, and, and people sort of laughed about it, we started with a list of 86 sites. We took the area, and all we took out was religious institutions, um, schools, and uh, we tried to, to take out as much residential as we could, um, and just had a complete universe of everything else in the area. Um, and that we did, we had, uh, I think we, when did we complete that, Angela? Kevin? April. April. We completed that in April. Um, and then the next step um, that we're coming towards the end of is to try to really focus in on sites that we think might actually be workable. Um, and we've gotten down um, to 14 sites. What we eliminated were sites that were too small to hold a tank or be combined with an adjacent site to hold a tank. 
um, and we also took out tanks that we thought were um, too far away. They were, they were outside uh, the functional part of the sewer system so that they would be able to capture enough of the CSOs um, in one location. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, we're looking for two sites, one for uh, the um, Red Hook 034 and one for Al's Head 007. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through these sites. You'll see as we go along, and I know all of you are very familiar with, with the, the neighborhood, um, so I hope you'll be able uh, to see this even though it's a little small. Um, you'll see that some of the sites are different configurations of the same properties, uh, maybe with one different property included. What we were looking for was something that was big enough to hold the tank, a larger tank in the case of 007, a smaller tank in the case, did I do it right? No, a larger tank in the case of 34 at the head of the canal, a smaller tank in the case of 007. Um, this color designates manufacturing. We obviously like being in with the manufacturing. This is mixed use and that light blue is residential. And what, we are, what we're hoping to find is a site that both has enough space for the size tank, the maximum size tank that we expect to have to build, and also we hope has some lay down area where we can do the construction without having to take up too much of the street space um, to do it. So this is the first site, as you can see. Um, this is for uh, Red Hook 34. You can see it runs from Union Street um, to Carroll. It's on the west side of the canal, um, and it uh, has both enough uh, space for the larger tank, and it has some staging area. And I'll just keep going. We can come back to these sites. All right, the second site that um, we have identified as being a potential site um, is runs from Butler to Sackett, is on the east side of the canal. Um, it's right across from our pumping station, um, right there, and um, it has both uh, room for the tank and room for staging. The third site is uh, back to Union Street on the east side of the canal and runs from Union down to Carroll um, and has room for a tank and for staging. The fourth site um, is below Carroll Street, um, has room for both. It's on the east side of the canal. It's getting a little farther away from the head of the canal, but because of the configuration of the sewer, uh, the engineers think it still has potential. And I'm sorry, I should have said before to get a more of an overview over here in the right-hand corner. It sort of gives it to you in relation to the whole area. The fifth site, is between Douglas and DeGraw. You all will recognize this is the, the playground site, the Thomas Green Park, um, and it's between Nevins and Third Avenue. The sixth site um, for the Red Hook 034 is the same Thomas Green Park site, but with an additional staging area west of Third. The seventh site is below Douglas and DeGraw. It goes from DeGraw to Sackett um, and runs from Third to the canal. So you'll see, as you can see, as I said, some of these sites are different parcels configured different ways. Okay, now the potential sites for Owl's Head 007. The first one is um, right where the canal Splits. It's at basically at Bond and, and uh, south of 4th, um, and it's now a sanitation site. You all may be familiar with it as such. The second site would be a, a larger uh, site on the same location with a couple of parcels added, and this would be the staging area. The third site is, again, a different configuration uh, of, of Part of those sites that does not have the sanitation site in it. We don't have sign off for sanitation yet about this site, so it, this is a different configuration that doesn't use that site. The fourth, again, is still on the west side of 2nd Avenue um, and is another, uh, adds another site down here, but is, is similar. 
all these are between 6th and the canal, and between 2nd and the uh, more westerly part of the canal. Oops, sorry. The 5th is now east of 2nd Avenue and runs between 6th and the canal. The 6th is in that same area, slightly different combination of parcels, as is the 7th site. Okay, so those are the 14 sites. The steps we are going through now um, are looking at what I would broadly group as engineering criteria. That's the size of the site, not just how many square feet it is, um, but what it's shaped like. Do we think we could, what would we have to do to get a tank on this site? How deep would we have to go? How would we have to shape it? Um, the second is proximity to existing infrastructure. How easy uh, will it be to pump in and pump out? Um, and and how, um, how we will have to cross streets to do that? Um, and then the third is utility relocation because um, the utility re relocating utilities is very, very disruptive, um, obviously, um, and expensive primarily because the utilities are always in the middle of the street. Uh, it disrupts everything to do that. And then the second group is what we're generally calling land use and environmental criteria. Uh, so that's the surrounding land use. What's it across the street from or next to? Um, obviously, if it's surrounded by uh, manufacturing or next to the canal, that's um, that's preferable to being next to uh, residential. Um, is it disturbing historic and cultural resources? Um, what, are, what are the known contamination or hazardous materials? Some of these sites, those of you who are familiar with this process, will recognize the sites that have already been identified for some kind of remediation. But there are other sites here that we don't know uh, what's on the site. Um, so we have to explore that a little bit to um, test the feasibility of doing it. And then the last is really community disruption. Um, and that's about how much, what's this next to, how many uh, streets it would, we would have to cross with the utility relocation, a whole variety of criteria around that. What we're trying to do is work through and give each of these sort of a ranking in terms of uh, not yes, no, but how good is it, how poor is it, and then among these, sort of come up with a sense of which ones uh, are most important. We may give one, some a little more weight than others. Um, this will all be, we'll share this information, uh, but we're just, we're trying to um, get something that gives us a sense of which the best candidates are um, at this point. And we will be finishing that work and submitting it to EPA at the end of the month. So we will submit that to them, and then we have um, almost a year to um, actually um, choose the final site. And that sounds like a very long time, but there's a lot that we have to do to actually choose those sites. Um, we will really almost be designing for each of the sites, because we think that when we get to two for each tank, that they will both be candidates with a lot um, of potential. But also, there's not a single site here that doesn't also have things about it that may, may make it difficult. Um, so we will then really drill down on how would we locate a tank? How deep would it have to go? What will we have to excavate? Exactly what are the utilities there? Where would they have to go? What kind of remediation will we have to do if there's contamination? Um, we will also be thinking a lot about how we would get the wastewater into the site and out of the site, which also affects um, how big the pumping um, machinery has to be. And all of these things will affect how complicated the construction is, um, impacts of the community again in much more detail. And all of these things will feed in to the cost because something, for example, if all the soil has to be disposed of as hazardous material, um, that can skyrocket the cost. Um, so it might be that there are two that are quite close to each other in every other way, but one's going to be enormously more expensive than the other. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, um, you know, it's, although it is, uh, although it is not EPA's responsibility to worry about the cost, 
it's our responsibility to try to find um, a less expensive versus a more expensive one if they'll both work because this ultimately will go on the water rate. Um, we, when we get farther along, at some point after the first of the year, uh, probably in the spring, we're anticipating um, that we would come back to a general meeting like this and give an update on how we're doing with selecting the final site. We will know at that point a whole lot more about how we would fit a tank onto the site. And we also will know a lot more because we will have been doing the long-term control plan for DEC. So we will know a lot more about um, what we think uh, a tank should look like, uh, whether that first estimate of eight and four um, is the right size. Uh, we don't have reason to think it won't be the right size, but we certainly want to explore that and report back to EPA, although that's actually more of a work we're doing on uh, the long-term control plan. Um, so we will come back and we think we have enough information to justify calling, asking you all out to a meeting for an evening um, to give you a sense of how it's going. The other processes, as I mentioned, I just want to mention again, um, towards the end of October, we will have be having a similar meeting to talk about the long-term control plan. Now, that process is a lot more focused on uh, water quality levels, on a, a broader range of uh, tools we might use uh, to reduce uh, CSOs, a lot more about green infrastructure, so it will be slightly different. Um, and so we hope people will be interested in hearing about that as well. Although where we want to end up, obviously, is in the same place, which is better water quality in the Gowanus and an intelligent way of getting there. Um, and then we, to answer questions about specifically um, the disruption around uh, utility work and what, just to give people an update, because people have been waiting for these high-level sewers. We're doing them in two phases. We haven't done a public meeting about them lately. So we'll be having that meeting as well in October. Um, what I just showed you, we're going to put on our website. Um, so we went randomly quickly, but you can go on um, and look at those sites and see what you think. And while we are giving um, the report, we hope to complete ranking and pulling out two sites for each of two tanks by the end of the month. We don't hope to. We can order to and we will. Um, we wanted to give, as a, as a, as a general input, uh, an opportunity. So we have a, uh, an email address. It is gowanus at dep.nyc.gov. So if, in addition to whatever conversation we have now, you have other thoughts you'd like to give us um, over the next week, um, we would be happy to receive those um, at that, at that uh, email address to give, uh, give you more time to uh, give us your thoughts as you think about this over the next week. I'm sorry? Can you repeat the address? Yes. Uh, Gowanus at DEP. Dot NYC dot gov. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Lloyd will be taking questions. We will be passing around a hand mic for people who raise their hand and want to ask questions. Uh, the only reading, reason this meeting is being shared by me at, for Community Board 6 is twofold. I am always available. And the second reason is it gets the people from permits and licensing part of our committee to have to come and listen so that when we actually do have to do motions some time during, down the road, they actually are somewhat familiar with this. So all that being said, uh, we would love to take questions, hear concerns and issues that may be raised, and let's get started. Well, we have a mic. I don't know if you need it. Have you established a laundry list of contaminants that you'll search for and any uh, vision of what protocols will be used for sampling, how deep, soil, uh, etc.? I'm going to ask you. When we do a site assessment, we will characterize the site um, as thoroughly as possible, and we typically will look at a whole suite 
of petroleum compounds, we'll look at metals, we'll look at um, volatile organic compounds. So we have a full suite of contaminants that we'll be analyzing for. And with respect to that, the reason we do that is we look to protect the construction workers and the occupants of nearby structures and residences. Well, that's a really good question. It's usually very site specific. So I think what we'll be doing is looking at the records that New York State DEC has kept on some of those upland properties. In fact, we're about to sort those conversations now that we've identified some properties. So the idea would be that we would be looking for soil contamination, and we could go very deep for that with respect to some of these sites where there may be coal tar that's deposited. And then we would also be looking to protect the groundwater. Back in the back over there. Good evening. My name is Joanne Brown. And I'm the Tenant Association over there, 572 574 Warm Street. And I'm also, too, I also started up on community but with NYC Community United. My question to you is that you're geared around all the homeowners, really with the flooding and the sewage that's going on. But then you're forgetting all about the one, I'm talking about NYCHA. Okay, not the homeowners, NYCHA projects. Put it like, now you know what I'm talking about. You have Gowanus, you have Wyckoff, and then Warren Street across the street. Across the street there in Warren Street, we have nothing but flooding over there. Raw sewage is, is backing up into people's apartments, all in their kitchen, their bathrooms, coming all the way through their whole apartment over there, okay? And then they're saying that they can't be doing the dog on sewage until here it is 15, 2015. But then you over here, you're saying that you're zoning out over the past path mark and what have you. Those are private homes that have been there for years, I mean, well, for centuries. Those are old historical homes that's over there. Then you want to be digging and going, and going like digging up more, more sewage and what have you, but then no one is trying to help the one that's right here. I mean, well, to me, people, you should be looking at the ones that don't have as much, well, I say, um, not as fortunate as the ones that own their own home, but we have to do rental. But we need help across the street here, but with Warren Street and White Cop and Gowanus. I mean, the Gowanus, they need their community centers to be fixed so that people can be able to go over there and have their kids to go there rather for doing some kind of homework or something there. Look out for us sometimes, too, as well, as you're looking at to be digging up all these here sewage and be building all these condominiums. You're knocking down all the mom and pop stores here, but then you're building all these condominiums. They are not low income, because you have people that's paying two and three thousand dollars rather for rent. I don't call that no, 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 no low income. But I'm just saying, look out for the one day, they, well, they're not, okay, now let me get you a good one here. I lost my job, okay, but then there's other people too that have lost their jobs as well, but then they're still struggling. But they still try to make our ends meet. But then no one is looking out for them. So somebody gonna have to look out rather for the grandparents and other people too as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, and I also would like to thank the Wyckoff tenants for inviting us here to be with them. And I think... And we will be, we would be really derelict if the work we were doing was not also addressing problems here. Um, and we will follow up with um, the management here about the problems they're having. My guess is that we already know uh, something about it, but we will uh, be sure to follow up and see if there's something we can address more quickly. What is 
the process by which you acquire some of the properties that you showed us? Because my, I'm thinking there's some of that's private property. Is that so? Can you explain how you would go about obtaining that property, and is that factored into your? Because some of the properties you showed us are city property currently, and others are are private. Well, obviously, if we could inherit a piece of city property, that would be um, attractive to us. Um, unless there's a use on it that, or a or contamination on it, makes it that might make it slower and more difficult, or if it's in a location that doesn't work well in terms of the hydrology. Um, I think that in terms of acquiring the property, our first choice is always to purchase the property. Um, we understand that that may um, not be that easy because there's a lot of speculative interest in properties in this area right now. Um, at the end of the day, I think with EPA, we would have to determine um, whether a property was so compelling that we would try to acquire it um, even if the owner didn't want to sell it. Um, but, uh, but we really would try to avoid that very, very hard. But if we're, some of the sites you showed us there are known to be contaminated, I mean, devastatingly contaminated. That is the site of a manufactured gas plant. Right. And so one of them would be, even what you showed us is private property that's also known to be one of the most contaminated sites in the area. And you, but when you guys are talking about it, you're sort of talking about it like avoiding those spots. I think in, in, in my view, if you're gonna dig a 60 foot hole, wouldn't the idea to be to dig a 60 foot hole and get rid of that contamination at the same time? I mean, that one of the sites is directly on the canal. It's known to be leaching, you know, coal tar to this day into the, the canal. Isn't you know, wouldn't that be an, an obvious goal to combine the efforts and to to potentially defer costs to to National Grid for that cleanup and dig you know dig your 60 foot hole and and get rid of it. Well, I think we I think we have we have included sites with known contamination. Some of them well documented. Some of them. Uh, not so, and at this point, we've really been neutral about that because we we're trying to do this in a sort of stepped way. Um, I, yes, I think that I think that EPA would certainly agree that killing two birds with one stone would be um, a good way to go. We obviously are concerned about um, how the costs would get sorted out, um, but I think all that will get get resolved in the in the process in the next stages. I'm looking to EPA. He's nodding. So, thank you, Kristen. Hi, I'm Marlene Donnelly. I'm a member of the CAG. I have a question of your criteria that you laid out on the list there, because you have several sites that are south of Union Street, or remote from um, the actual um, site that's supposed to be catching sewage from. As Kevin taught us on the uh, Stakeholders Committee more than 10 years ago that the contamination is coming on what's called the first flush. That's all the stuff that's stewing in the, in the pipes that gets pushed out when the rain first starts. And I would think that the top reason for these plant, um, holding tanks is to keep the stuff that the EPA says is contaminating the water out of the water. So you would want to be able to pick the first flush out so that we don't have the brown tsunamis. So I'm looking at the sites below Union Street and I'm wondering how in the world you can catch the stuff at the head of the canal. It's already in the canal before it could ever reach there. So I think to me the top priority work in terms of criteria would be does it achieve what it's expected to achieve in containing the solid uh, contaminant sediments that you're, you're going to be catching there so uh, and I'm also a little concerned because you're entertaining and spending a lot of money on consultants to look at these alternative sites which are might have a little possibility but might not ever achieve what they're supposed to do when maybe that consultant money could be used to push to solve some of the problems that the Gowanus houses
Hello, Senator Montgomery has joined us. Nice to see you. Uh, do you have a question or should I go right to the next person? Hi, good evening. Good evening, my name is Beverly Corbin and I'm a member of Fury and I'm on Fury's board. I live in White Cork Gardens and I'm also partnering with Ms. Brown um, with her organization bringing these three developments together. Um, my question to you is, with all the cleaning and the sewage that's going to be falling out, it is going to fall back, as you know, in Warren Street houses and during the um, Sandy Hurricane destroyed a lot of Gowanus property and deteriorated a lot of things that were going on there. In these developments, we have an enormous rate of people on hemodialysis. We have a lot of young people who have asthma. When you start to flush those lines out, again, rodents are gonna come back over in this direction because there's not a big property level in between private homes because there are a lot of factories and industrial areas. The rodents are gonna come back into these three developments. Again, we're gonna have a problem. We have children already in this area with asthma. That's going to be a big problem. You're going to be diverting traffic to send traffic back down 3rd Avenue where we have a, two elementary schools, one on 4th and one right here on Pacific, a high school right down the block. The, the fumes are going to cause confusion in that way. What protection do you have for the people that live in public housing in these three developments? What is the protection going to be in this particular area? looking at not just the construction but also looking at the air quality and the lower environment because you have, you're flushing out pumps that have been there for a while you're going to be digging up grounds where rat nests are we saw that happen in some of the developments that happened on third avenue they went in and they dug and rats were brought up with the shell with the um shovel so what's going to happen to protect the environment of the people that live in these three developments from rats and um, roach infestation and whatever stuff is in that ground when it comes up. Lining up the way of poisons that's not going to affect and kill our children or have all kinds of different birth defects going on. I know you're going to try to contain it, but what guarantees do we have that you're really going to try to contain it and it's not going to affect the people that live in these developments? In terms of rats, there are definitely techniques, some that are more effective than others. And we, I will commit to right now to personally see to it that we have the most aggressive rat control we can possibly have. It's a really, really difficult thing, as you know. Um, as anyone who's been around construction, especially areas um, where there's been a lot of trash bearing over the years, um, you know, it's going to be a big problem. But I will try to watch that personally. Um, I'll be happy to speak to it in meetings. Can't promise you miracles, but we'll, we'll take it very 
Jerry Armour, and I'm a member of the CAG. Um, I have a question that concerns the 14 sites. At some point, you're going to go down, you will have whittled them down to two sites. Exactly what role can the community play in this evaluation, or is it internal to DEP exclusively? So uh, to answer the question, we did not specifically exclude playgrounds. In fact, the Double D Pool is still um, one of the 14 sites that we're going to be looking at. Um, and uh, to answer the question regarding the flood zone, um, obviously uh, it would be nice to be able to build outside of the flood zone, um, but we are dealing with Gowanus Canal, all the infrastructure uh, um, that, would, that would be required to convey flow to the tanks and away from the tanks would have to be near Gowanus Canal. And that's why um, we're looking at sites that are very close to the canal. Um, with uh, the projects that, you know, that would be proposed, we would be looking to protect vulnerable equipment, the electrical equipment, the pumping equipment, that sort of thing, from a potential flood. So the facility itself might flood, but any equipment that would be damaged by that flood would, would be protected. We're doing um, something very similar right now at the Gowanus facilities upgrade, the pumping station, and uh, the flushing tunnel um, um, upgrades, all the electrical equipment, even if there were another flood similar to Hurricane Sandy, that equipment would be protected from that flood. There's also, there's also work going on, which you're probably familiar with, that's looking um, at protecting against storm surge. There are a bunch of projects that are being looked at, including one, I think, at the, at the mouth of the Gowanus uh, to try to protect from storm surge. We have, we have Hello, uh, quick question. Uh, one of the sites that we wanted to see that I, I wasn't so sure if it was there was the Con Ed lot, which is on Butler Street. Was that one of the sites that was actually listed or proposed? Uh, 
I'm just saying it's a very large lot, which is close to the site, and I was wondering why it was actually taken off. I believe it was removed because the size. In addition, uh, there is a planned substation uh, development for that for that lot at this point. And I can get you more details after the meeting. I, I can follow up with you. To to kind of combine the questions about the environmental impact of this plan and the community involvement. Is it your thought or understanding that these actions would happen under a Euler proceeding or would there not be a Euler involved? I think that's not clear yet. Um, a, whether it's, whether it's required under CERCLA uh, and it, whether there is enough time to go through that process. So, although that, I don't think, I think that's less of an issue. Um, certainly we envision, and I'm sure EPA would agree, um, a lot of community input. Uh, I'm just not sure exactly what the, how it will be structured. But does the EPA know how it will be structured? The EPA does know how it will be structured. Do you want to answer? Steve. Steven, did you have to ask that question? <laughs> so uh, we, we are going to continue the community involvement that we have had for uh, the, the canal uh, part uh, of, the, of the remediation. And, and so I, I should say that we have said that a formal uh, environmental impact uh, study is not required. Uh, and so the process is shortened. But uh, at all stages of uh, of uh, the selection, design, and construction, the community relations uh, will continue uh, in, you know, in, in the same format that uh, we have been conducting community relations for the entire Superfund site, meaning uh, at meetings with the community, at community centers, and with a CAC. Uh, and, and so uh, New York City will be participating in those meetings. Uh, New York City might want to uh, initiate uh, you know, those meetings, and then we will be present as we are today. So the community uh, exchange will, con will continue as it has uh, throughout the process, uh, the Superfund process. Can I just say, just to, well, I, I, I understand how it could be useful to move forward with speed, but I would hope that the EPA can understand that the ULERP in this community or in New York City, because of the way that the city is structured, we have found it a useful mechanism by which we can not only hold the city accountable, but sort of drive other actions and make sure that things like the, the housing here is protected and, and, and make, it, it's a mechanism. I wouldn't want to see that the, the I, I'm all for the speed, but, Please, as we move forward, understand that it is a very, it is a tool that the community uses to get the city to acknowledge problems. Okay, we, we take the comment and we will continue that conversation next uh, Tuesday. We have a CAG meeting. We will be there and, and we will elaborate more, more on that. Good evening, everybody. My name is Janine Sandrini Cook. I would like to remind everybody something we always forget is that Sandy was only, uh, no picture, sweetheart, my, my face belongs to me. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sandy was only a force one a hurricane. Let me repeat, a force one hurricane. Let's think a little bit of what would happen if the next one, or when the next one, will be force two, three, or four. Uh, these poor people over there, I, I was feeling for them, 
who struggled so much with the devastation of the overflow, we have to think about them. I chuckled, I have to say, when I heard about the green infrastructure. And I thought, my goodness, I have done green infrastructures for 30 years around this neighborhood. It's not working too much because as soon as we bring the green infrastructures, the dog owners bring their dogs, kill all the plants we've been planting around that will retain water. So at the, day, at the end, everybody is giving up what kind of green infrastructure we can have if we don't also work with dog owners. Uh, second, I have a very, very plain question. We're talking about pollutants. Disposing of pollutants, how are we going to dispose of them? Where are they going? What are we going to do with them? Are they going to be recycled? We we'll know that being recycled is more polluting than producing anything. Where are they going? In the ocean, in the rivers? I'd like to know. Uh, also, we said about the tanks, so they will be underground. What will be built on top? Housing, whatever. Playgrounds, why not? Oh, because they will leak sooner or later. How are they going to be built? With what? Corrosion of pollution is so intense, nothing, nothing can sustain the corrosion of pollution. Everything will be cracked very soon, 10 years, 15, uh, maybe 12. And where, where, where is the, the, this thing is going to go? Leaching into what? I want to know. I live far from this, but I want to know for the people who are living next to it. Also, we have lots of luxury buildings. What do they do with their own sewage? Are they bringing this here? What kind of uh, 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 demands we, do we put as a city on these buildings? I see nobody, nobody is building anything that is sustainable. Nothing is green. Everything is glass. Imagine, imagine how much heating and cooling these glass buildings will require. There is nobody's building anything with solar panels on top. Nobody. And so I'd like to know, since they're going to just open their sewage and drink and drive that away from them, do we demand that they do something for their sewage? I wonder. I want to know. Also, I'm sorry, I burden you, but I, f I will forget, I will forget. Uh, the, the fall is coming. We are told that the first uh, pollution is the most important, that means leaves, etc., etc. Well, the machines that clean up the streets don't pick up much of the, the, uh, the leaves. All these leaves stay there. Most people, we have to work also on people to remind them that they should not uh, 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 sweep their, their, their own uh, sidewalk onto the streets. I clean up my street on Pacific. I cannot tell you how many garbage bags I pick up. We have to, to employ some, first of all, tell the people they should pick up their own leaves and not put that on the streets. But we have so many young kids who are unemployed how come we will not bring these kids, these young people, to find a job at cleaning up the streets from the leaves? This way, this way we could have clean and reduced first flow of pollution. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm sorry, but I have to say it. And also, why don't we ask in the schools kids to tell their parents about picking up leaves because after all the kids will bring the, 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 the news home picking up kids uh, leaves why not ask people who live next to retention uh, basin uh, no, how do you call that uh, not the retention basin how do you call that the, ca the, the, the drain the catch basins uh, the number of time i go all around the neighborhood when before it rains 
Thank you, sweetheart. Before it rains, to pick up the garbage from the, 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 these basins. It's not, my face belongs to me, honey. Uh, it, it, is, it is not my job. Why not ask people who live there at the corner of the businesses to pick it up? Thank you for your patience. I assume that was more of a statement than a rhetorical oh, question. Oh, that's the question. I'm just trying to be as... Okay. Very good. I, if I could just mention one thing, because it's come up several times, the tank does get the first one, and it holds it. She's not going to discharge it into the canal. It holds it until there is capacity at the wastewater treatment plant. It goes to the wastewater treatment plant where everything gets screened out of it. And where, including most of the solids, and as well as all the debris, um, and then it's disinfected before the effluent is discharged. So we would be thrilled if everyone would clean up the leaves. It's a huge problem because, particularly with strong storms, you're exactly right. Even when people do sweep them up, or sanitation sweeps the ash basin, if the rain comes down heavily, every bit of debris in the street goes and sits on the cat face and basically makes a mat uh, so that the water can't get into the cat face. And so um, we very much endorse the recommendations. And what would happen if you were Well, they will go into the tank and then they go to the wastewater treatment plant where as many as we are able to remove. And that becomes sludge. Sludge then goes to a beneficial reuse. Uh, in some cases, it's used for fertilizer on golf courses. In some cases, but it's disinfected. In some cases, um, it is used to um, fill old mines. A variety of uses uh, are made of. All of these are quite expensive, by the way. Over here. Hello, good evening. My name is Sabine Aronowski, and on the CAG, I represent the Friends of Thomas Green Park group, which was listed twice, um, the, the site was listed twice tonight as a potential site for the tank. So I want to ask a few questions, and I, I'd like to make a recommendation that you provide um, some actual designs for us to understand what a retention tank looks like and what that means. Um, if, does that mean if you take the site um, to build a retention tank that you um, can still have a park and a pool that's safe for children to use um, after you're finished with it? And what about additional um, community impacts and benefits? We talked about, um, you talked about resources um, on your criteria, but uh, what about like community benefit? So um, if you did take that site, um, do you provide a temp? Can you? Will you uh, provide a temporary um, place for the children and the youth in this neighborhood to have a summer pool and to have a park and uh, um, restore the, restore once you're finished, or provide alternative locations um, so that we don't lose those benefits for generations to come? And also, I do want to um, make one mention about the Gowanus Community Center. You know um, that 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 is not open right now, and we really. Um, need uh, places for the community to to uh, gather um, locally and I think that should be factored in not just if you're providing um, financial incentives to private owners um, to build this we should think about some public incentives as well thank you Certainly, it adds a tremendous amount of complexity 
uh, in terms of, of displacement of activities that are, are achieved in the community. Can you talk a little bit about what this is going to look like? Because when Kevin is in, in front of the, this committee before, yeah. albeit under a different commissioner, he pointed to Harry Bateson and that and saying that we wouldn't want that in this community. So can you tell us how this is going to look to the point and, and how this is going to be something that would work in our community? Well, I think what we can do that might be helpful is to show uh, slides of other facilities. Um, by and large, they're underground, but there is a need for a head house of some sort to come and go through and uh, store materials at various sites, sites at various the size of the tank, obviously. Uh, most of the, you know, the tank itself does not sit above the ground. The tank itself is below ground. Um, but there are other things, there's parking that's required. Um, so what we might do is just make available uh, pictures of some other tanks that are built. Yes. Flushings, paddies, um, alley creek. Um, and so the people can have some sense of what's like below. I remember the conversation you're referring to, and I, I, I think what I said was, you know, kind of lucky here in Los Cal, we have a bunch of water. It does a lot of water quality in the canal. It does, it does a great job supporting water quality. Um, in order to take us, you know, further to do, uh, you know, prevent the solids in the I was just wondering if uh, there's been any consideration of tax abatements for specifically local homeowners in regards to taking non-porous surfaces and creating rain gardens because that might have the effect of not only mitigating stormwater overflow but also creating jobs in the community. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for coming to the Gowanus. My name is Owen Foote. I've been exposing people to this uh, contaminated waterway for the last 15 years. Um, I understand that the EPA has a plan to slightly improve the waterway so that 10 years from now or longer, when I uh, go canoeing on it, it'll be slightly less contaminated, but I'll continue to be exposing people to contamination. I don't really have a question, but I do have a request, and maybe for the follow-up meeting, on how we can spend the next decade trying to achieve federal funds to actually go a step beyond the current plan to clean it a little bit and actually clean in this so that perhaps someday in the future when we recreate on this water body, we're not exposed to contamination. Thank you.
Um, I'm a member of the CAG, and many of us uh, have been have been have been at this for quite some time, and uh, we know that since the Superfund process started, that the city has at some times not been the most willing partner in taking the responsibility that the city has in the cleanup. Um, when at the beginning of the meeting you mentioned that the city had proposed 86 sites at the beginning, it seemed rather laughable and I think, you know, uh, you might agree that to the community that seemed like every site in the Gowanus area was being uh, looked at. Now we're down to 14, you have a deadline at the end of the month to propose something to the EPA. How much money has a city spent on consultants to come up with the siting. Um, you know, as a taxpayer, I think that to me it looks as though the city is trying to make this process more expensive than it needs to be. And I would like to know how much to date has a city spent on consultants, on, on just trying to come up with 86 sites and now to 14 sites. I think most of us could have done this, probably, you know, come up with five sites that probably would have fit the build without spending so much money. So I would like to know how much exactly. Well, that's a, a reasonable question. I guess I have an answer, but uh, we'll email the the people will be glad to uh, get that information to you. Yes, I should know. Can you send an exchange to the My name is Paul Basile. I, I just have a question. I could never understand the engineering challenges that you guys are facing with this. But to what extent were the uh, the canal has a few inlets that were used as turning basins for the tugboats and barges, and they're not used extensively anymore. To what extent were they considered as to being shortened, perhaps, and use those as tanks since they're already dug, and then the, the surface could be open park land or public accessible area without having to dig since it's already dug and needs to be dredged and cleaned anyway, or incorporating some of the tanks in the new bulkhead systems that need to be built along the canal. So as far as you, you know, your second question, if, if there is a site that's uh, uh, just right up against the canal, we will certainly have to reconstruct the bulkhead. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, these tanks are, uh, the, the foundations go, go down, you know, on the order of 30 to 40 feet. There's actually some other structural work to prevent um, the tanks from uplifting when they're empty. Uh, um, that, that would require excavations even deeper than that. So there would certainly be some level of reconstruction of the bulkheads necessary to support a tank above and beyond what would be required just to, to perform some dredging in the canal. So that, that would certainly take place for any option where the tank is right up against the, um, the canal. Um, and w can you explain the other question again? The canal has several basins that were turning. The, so, so you... Sure. So um, we, we have uh, conceptually looked at some tank locations within the bed of the canal, either, either in, in a turning basin or even in the canal itself, and, and, and also looking at alternatives where we're using um, the bed of the canal to convey sewage. So you would, you would construct, uh, you know, pipes or sewers within the bed of the canal. We have conceptually looked at that. Um, as far as the turning basins, we don't believe that we would be allowed to actually fill in the turning basin and, 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 and not have it uh, as water. And, and for example, uh, the record of decision actually requires one turning basin, a, a, a turning basin that was there historically, it's no longer there, it's been filled in, it's the first street turning basin. So that has to be re-daylighted as part of the, um, the record of decision, it has to be restored. So we don't believe that that is an option that, would, that we'd be able to pursue. Okay, hello. 
I don't need, everybody know who I am because I already spoke. Joanne again, okay? My question is, see, I live right there in Warren Street. And my two developments over there, all of this here flooding and whatever, and then y'all wanna build, I'm gonna say this again. See, I'm asthmatic and I have psychosis. And I also have a lot of other people that's in my development across that street there. They are really suffering. They either children are really asthmatic over there. You got a lot of elderly over there that's really suffering too. And then all this here bacteria that y'all doing and all this here uh, chemicals and all that stuff, I'm saying to you, by the time that y'all get to start digging and what have you, most of them people, I'm, wait a minute, not elderly, I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say our grandparents, okay? Uh oh, that's my word. Always say grandparents. By the time that they get to a certain age, and I'm not going to say up there, all right? But we don't want them to just say pass away or either just wither away because they're smelling all these here fumes that's coming up in their windows late in the nighttime, either during the daytime because they can't close the windows and all that stuff is just coming in. And then once they see all the fumes, then they still going to have the roaches, the rats, that's coming up in the, in, the, in the housing. Of course, the sewage as usual. But I'm saying to you, as the DEP, that they still here. Yes, he is, okay, he's still here, and a few others. My, I'm saying to you is look to see what kind of um, sewage or either whatever, um, wait a minute. There, there's some kind of, um, uh, like a pipeline, there you go, thank you very much pipeline that you can be running through Warren Street over there so that they won't be having, because we are on a hill. Every time that, that rain comes down, remember the water's going down a hill. Remember White Cup is up, remember that, okay? Remember when you're walking on White Cup, you're going up a hill. And when you're going across the street to Warren, you're going down the hill. That's where all of the water is being flooded, you know, that it's coming, flowing down in that, in that area, what I'm asking you is, and then see, can you do some kind of protection or something, rather, well, while you're building, okay, so that they wait, it won't be back and back up into the, in the people's apartment and all that stuff, you know, really, because right now, I had to deal with mold. Other people are dealing with mold over there on Warren Street, and it's a lot of mold, and I'm going to tell you, this is why I'm sick right now, really, because of the mold attacking my lungs. And I have the letters and all the documentation to prove it, okay? But you still got to look out for the little people. I'm going, when I say little people, I'm talking about the babies. And then I'm going to say my grandparents. We got to look out for them too as well. Because remember, we got to make sure that, that, that somebody can be there, brother, generations and generations. Then they can come back and say, oh, yeah, you know what? We had this meeting over here in White Cop, And Miss So-and-so had this meeting. She was telling us all of these things. So this is why we are able to stand here today and say, this is our home that we are proud to be here. And then we can help the next person. You understand what I'm saying? This is for the next generations. This is what I'm trying to say to you. So please just help us, OK? That's all I'm asking. and I'm on the CAG, and I want to also say that I kind of resent <clears throat> the, that the description of the cleanup as not very effective. It's certainly not as effective as I would like it to be. I would like it to be fishable and swimmable. I'm hoping that maybe someday it could be, but I certainly think it is not a low-level cleanup that EPA is proposing. Now I'm a little prejudiced because I'm retiring from EPA January 31st, but any, I don't work in Superfund, I work someplace else. So that's one thing I wanted to respond to. The other thing is, <clears throat> are there, if the, 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 the park is going, to, where the pool is, is going to become one of those sites, is there any plan to offer, I know that we had floating pools near, in the Brooklyn Bridge Park, I have no idea the dimensions of those, I don't know if anything of that nature could be provided to the community as a, as, as a you know, something to do in lieu of using the pool during the construction. I, I think the community 
suffers enough and i think it would be nice if if the e p or anybody who has the power could help provide that well i think you know we feel very concerned about the smoking uses of that part and epa I, i'm not i'm not an expert in the circle but i think they're really not meant to think about the cost that they're really meant to think about cleaning it up but we have to think about we can't i have a very hard time with thinking about cost because it's not tax dollars it's the water rate the right of the water rate that we have to get voted every year and worry about it going up. So um, I don't, I try to think about doing it in a way that does not take on a lot of other costs unnecessarily. So I totally understand your point um, and it sounds like it would be a very reasonable thing for someone to want if it's cool to figure it out in condition for the years too. Uh, but I also, one part of my brain is saying, gee, I'm wondering how much that's going to cost. So uh, I certainly hear the comment. Um, I'm hoping we will be able to avoid having to do something like this. Okay, before, before we go on to the next question, I want you to know we're starting to run on time, so only a few more questions. And if those questions could be directed towards the issue that we hear mainly about tonight, about the pension tax, that would be greatly appreciated. Hi, uh, Dan Wiley from Congresswoman Nidia of Alaska's office. Um, I just wanted to uh, express a, an invitation to DEP to actually maybe come to a tenant meeting of the, the, the housing authority tenants. Um, they have one, uh, they have a couple, you know, coming up on Tuesday. And we have raised um, the issue of NYCHA and DEP uh, needing to come together because there tends to be some finger pointing between the city side saying, well, the problem's in your pipe, and then Knight just saying, well, the problem's in your pipe. So if we can come together, we can help get our pipes in our order. Um, but I wanted to recognize DEP for um, increasing the capacity on the force main to get to pump more sewage to the Red Hook Water Pollution Control Plant. Uh, that hopefully is alleviating a lot of that Bond Lorraine loop that goes through Red Hook and impacts Red Hook public housing. So I'm hoping to see now that those, now that's activated, I'm hoping to see that we have fewer complaints, but we'd like to be vigilant on that. And also I do want to um, say thank you to EPA for also uh, getting us a situation where we can reduce the CSOs and actually capture more like 90 something percent of the liquids and 75 almost percent of the solids. But on the screening, I know you're, you're gonna go down to fewer sites, but on Monday, there was a meeting uh, with the community board at the 78th precinct about uh, a new per, a central parole facility to be located on 2nd Avenue at the end of the canal before it dead, end, dead ends into the 4th Street Basin which I think is actually one of the sites that you're looking at in your screening. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. But th th that parole facility is, I'm sure if you give the, a, a, a choice of the community, would you want the parole facility or the tank? That's an interesting question. But anyway, I just want to flag that. Hey everybody, my name is Steve Urich. I'm a uh, work in the area, I'm a business. Uh, two basic questions, are these types of tanks in use anywhere else in New York City? And if so, what have the results been? Oh, and how, what time period? And uh, secondly, are there still plans to um, renovate or, or uh, media, uh, t take out the pollutants under Thomas Green Park, or has that been abandoned? Is that an issue involved? Here? I, my understanding is that that is part of the remediation that's being overseen by uh, do I have that right? Which, which one was part of Park, the remediation there. Yeah. Uh, we, we have said, if I may. Yes, please. We have said several times before that uh, there's contamination. In the, there's has, an, an investigation has been done by the state, and there is contamination. Uh, my understanding is that shortly, in, in the coming weeks or uh, months, uh, certainly before the end of the year, I believe, uh, the state is going to come up with, uh, will propose uh, a plan 
for, for the cleanup of that site. So, as uh, the Commission said correctly, this is done under the supervision of uh, the state. And, and there will be, by the way, as I mentioned, I have mentioned before, no matter what, tank or not in that park, there is going to be work, excavation, which will disrupt, I believe, uh, the uses of the park. But it's forthcoming. And there's really one thing. Yes, there's one way to use that in the city. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, so uh, CSO storage tanks are, I want to say, a relatively new technology, and that's in relation to wastewater treatment plants. You know, waste, we've been building wastewater treatment plants in New York City for uh, just about 100 years um, now. But New York City was actually the first uh, city in the nation to build a combined sewer overflow storage facility. It's a Spring Creek facility located um, uh, in, 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 uh, in Brooklyn. On a, basically right off the Belt Parkway. Um, we built that in 1971. Um, but uh, we have built other CSO facilities, uh, mostly uh, within the last 10 years or so. We have the Paddigate Basin CSO facility. Someone had mentioned that earlier. That's on Paddigate Basin on, uh, on the south shore of Brooklyn, um, right off the Belt Parkway. Um, there's also one um, in Queens, right near Shea Stadium. It's called the Flushing Bay CSO facility that protects um, Flushing Creek and Flushing Bay. Um, we also have a smaller one in um, would be Northeast Queens called the Alley Creek facility. It's a, it's a pretty small facility. Um, so th these are where they are located within New York City. Um, there are uh, CSO facilities across the nation. Uh, I, I don't really know how many over the top of the top of my head, but a lot of older cities have them. There are some in Chicago and Cleveland and um, you know places where uh, combined sewers exist. The thing that tends to be fanciest about them is the electronics when you start trying to control them through electronic sensors and getting those designed right. That's probably the most complicated thing, but you know, you pump it in, you pump it out. It's, it's not hugely comp even I sort of understand. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to everyone. I want to just start by thanking uh, Community Board 6 for uh, facilitating, helping to faci facilitate this discussion. Thank you very much. And I uh, want to acknowledge uh, the executive director of the Fifth Avenue Committee, which is the other partnering organization with this, Michelle De La Uz, who is here with us tonight. Yes. And uh, I want to say that this is really, uh, I'm very inspired by the fact that, one, you decided to meet at this location because uh, this is really right at the middle, the center of uh, not only the Gowanus, but also uh, the largest community of residents in our area, right here in these three uh, public housing developments. So I'm happy that you, you decided to meet here. And um, we've been it's, been, it's always difficult to get people to participate, but if you come to their home, they come, they come out. So I'm happy to see, thank you. Uh, residents for welcoming us and for joining us this evening. And I, I would like to say that, um, that what, what I find that often happens is that you reach out to the tenant leadership. I think someone said we, we invited the tenant leaders uh, and they didn't come. Well, that happens a lot. So I'm here to say I go to whoever, wherever the leadership is. And very often it isn't the tenant leader, it's somebody else in the development. So whoever will come, that's who we invite. So I, I would hope that the CAG, we've had a meeting with residents in uh, Wyckoff, Warren, and Gowanus. They all came together on their own, invited me to come, and wanted to know how we could begin to address some of the issues that you're talking about here that they experience, right? And so uh, what I suggested to them, that they reach out to the CAG in particular, to Fifth Avenue, I think Fifth Avenue Committee was at our meeting, and we decided that they will aggressively join and work with the CAG and the other members of the wider community because this is not just 
the brownstone community. This is not just one part of Gowanus, but this is an issue that really impacts all of us over here. So I'm happy that we're here tonight, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion with you guys, all of us being involved together. And uh, please take names, do whatever's necessary. Make sure Board 6, if you, Board 6 is really the, probably going to be the, uh, and Fifth Avenue Committee. They will be the organizations to, and the CAC, and the CAC. So we want to make sure that Wyckoff, Gowanus, and Warren, uh, and Commissioner, thank you as well for putting this uh, discussion together. We want to make sure that they are part of the discussion and the solution and the resolution. So thank you, everybody.